Hey everybody, it's Mark Taylor Canfield here in Seattle, in the Emerald City, where it's been rainy and cold and not much of a spring so far. But I wanted to talk to you all about something that is very important to me, and if you've checked out my YouTube channel videos before, or seen my appearances on the Jeff Santos Show, or the Tom Hartman Show, or any of my videos, uh, or the MTC Report, my YouTube channel, and thank you, by the way, for everybody who has subscribed. I love you. Thanks for supporting me. It's really important to support independent media in these times when there's such a huge uh, proliferation of media monopolies around the country. And I can talk about that in a, in a minute. But this is sort of the presentation, a summary of a presentation that I've made several times um, in front of the 43rd District uh, Washington State Democrats um, and for other groups. I also did a presentation for a conference in The Hague in the Netherlands during the uh, Summit for Democracy sessions that took place on March 29th and 30th. Um, and that uh, conference was on media viability so in other words how do we get uh, independent media and public media and community media to be economically viable in in the mark the media markets today around the world so I spoke specifically at that conference of course about the United States and it goes something like this my statement Hi, my name is Mark Taylor Canfield. I serve as Executive Director for Democracy Watch News, a nonprofit news organization covering challenges to democracy worldwide. Our podcast is called The Democracy Cast. I'm also a singer in a rock band, so if you want to know more about that, you can check out my music video called Mother Freedom, dedicated to people fighting for freedom and justice around the world. I'm a weekly guest on The Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. That's available on Facebook and uh, YouTube and Twitch TV and other places, also on radio. I also do news reports for the Tom Hartman program. I've been a writer for the Huffington Post and the Capitol Hill Times, and my writing has been published by the Seattle Times and Crosscut and you know dozens of other outlets. I believe that it is the obligation of every journalist, editor, and publisher to report on and speak out against threats to press freedom, which are by their very nature threats to democracy. A functioning democracy requires a well-informed electorate. I also have a few suggestions for potential legislative and public policy remedies to address local challenges to press freedom, but I'll get to those in a minute. Recently I presented information on challenges to press freedom in the US involving media monopolies during an international conference at The Hague in the Netherlands. That gathering was scheduled as part of the official Summit for Democracy events, which took place on March 29th and 30th. The conference where I presented my information was co-sponsored by the United Nations and UNESCO, and by the Global Forum on Media Development, or GFMD. Last week, I briefed Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal and her staff on loss of press freedom in the United States and our steady decline in ranking on the World Press Freedom Index. Every year on May 3rd, which has been designated as World Press Freedom Day by the United Nations, Reporters Without Borders releases their new rankings in terms of press freedom. Now you won't hear this reported in the US media except for the platforms where I report, but the United States is currently ranked 42nd in the world in terms of press freedom on the World Press Freedom Index. That means that according to Reporters Without Borders, there are 41 other nations where there's more freedom of the press and where it's easier and sometimes safer for journalists to do their jobs. Our country has experienced a steady drop in this ranking since 2002 when we were ranked 17th in the world in terms of press freedom. Well, unfortunately, nobody in the United States media seems to want to report on this issue or to hold themselves accountable for our decline in press freedom, despite my best efforts to lobby the top news organizations, magazines, and websites to try to get them to address this issue. But these news uh, organizations and outlets, they simply refuse to acknowledge our drop in the rankings. The important thing here for all of us to know is that next month on May 3rd, World Press Freedom Day, the new rankings on World Press Freedom will be announced. I'm registered for a conference that day sponsored by the Washington Post, 
where Reporters Without Borders will announce their new rankings on the World Press Freedom Index. I suspect that the United States' ranking will slip even further due to the political party propaganda coming out of the Fox network, and they recently had to settle a huge uh, lawsuit with Dominion and admitted to lying about the election in 2002, the, the uh, results of that election, or excuse me, the results of the 2020 election. Obviously, a press that is not free and one that is the most watched so-called news network when they're consistently lying to their viewers, that's not a free press. That's not a state-controlled media like you might find in some countries. It's a corporate-controlled media and a political party-controlled media, considering that the Republicans are all about Fox News. So, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be the keynote speaker at this conference I've been referring to, where the new World Press Freedom Index rankings will be presented. But I predict that Secretary Blinken will not address the decline in the U.S. ranking during his speech, even though three of the co-host nations for the Summit for Democracy are actually ranked ahead of the United States in terms of press freedom on the World Press Freedom Index. That would be the Netherlands, Costa Rica, and Zambia. Unfortunately, also, members of the U.S. Congress don't even seem to know that the World Press Freedom Index exists, and I doubt that many people in the White House know anything about it as, as, or either. I testified, actually before the Federal Communications Commission, about the loss of local news coverage and the reduction in POC and female ownership of media that has resulted from corporate media ownership consolidation. And I'll get to some of those statistics in a minute, it'll blow your mind. But the, the amount of media monopolies, uh, the, the size of media monopolies in the United States are, are just insane. The commissioners that, when I testified, claimed to have no knowledge of the research which they themselves had funded at three major universities uh, that showed the negative effects of corporate media ownership consolidation. I interviewed three professors and two of them told me that they would never accept another commission from the FCC to do their research because their findings had been suppressed by the FCC. And you can read my article about that at Truthout. Uh, I'll put a link down there so you can check that out. So let's look at the situation here locally in Seattle. One of the reasons that Reporters Without Borders has given for the drop in the U.S. ranking on press freedom is the lack of respect for freedom of the press by police during political protests, which is a whole other issue that I can get into um, during another video. But in many cases, uh, police at protests are attempting to silence the media by blocking their cameras or targeting the journalists with rubber bullets, etc. Um, I've been shot with rubber bullets while covering Black Lives Matter protests. I had concussion grenades thrown at me on May Day, and I was pepper sprayed in the face while trying to film the violent arrest of a young female protester during demonstrations against Donald Trump. So I know exactly what happens out there. And we can talk about that uh, during another video on some of the legislative and public policy uh, remedies for that. But, you know, let's just say that one major problem with freedom in the press in Seattle is that police officers are not trained to respect the rights of journalists who are working in the public interest during demonstrations, which there have been, you know, historically many here, going all the way back to the World uh, Trade Organization Ministerial Conference here in 1999, where tens of thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands, hit the street and to shut that conference down as an undemocratic, uh, an anti-environmental, anti-labor organization. Uh, there were huge Occupy Wall Street protests and encampments that went on in the city for months and months. Uh, I wonder if any of you remember that. The media sort of sweeps that under the rug as if the Occupy Wall Street movement never existed. Um, but it did. And um, I actually won a major lawsuit against a federal civil rights lawsuit against the Washington State Patrol because they arrested me during a sit-in when I was covering it as a reporter at the governor's office in uh, Olympia, Washington, at the state capitol there. Uh, and they tried to ban me from um, covering uh, the workings of my own government. I wrote, Judge Robert J. Bryan said it was a violation of freedom of the press, so I won that lawsuit. But um, 
let's talk about local ownership in media markets like the United States and that this will give you an idea of just how crazy this is so reporters without borders as I said is highly critical of the US because a, a small handful of media companies and wealthy individuals dominate all of the major media markets making it almost impossible for independent or publicly funded media to compete for example, iHeartMedia, formerly known as Clear Channel, owns 855 radio stations across the country. Yes, that's right, 855. Uh, they own these uh, companies, or they own these uh, radio stations all across the country in 160 media markets, including eight stations which they own right here in the city of Seattle. So if you go to the Odyssey building, you're liable to see eight radio DJs on the air all at the same time, um, right in the same office, because they're all the same company. I've been in that office, and I know. Uh, I've been a guest on Cairo multiple times in the past, and I do remember what that's like when you're in one of those corporate media monopoly office buildings where there's eight radio stations. Um, so... As I said, it's impossible for independent media and public and community media, alternative media, to compete in these markets when you have these kinds of uh, monopolies. Uh, across the country, iHeart owns streaming programming for many right-wing and conservative religious and religious stations. The runner-up in radio monopolies is Cumulus Media, which owns 404 radio stations in 85 markets. And they claim through the stations it owns and via 9,400 affiliated stations through the Westwood One network, they reach about 200 million people with their broadcasts. So, yeah, that's a pretty big monopoly. This Odyssey is actually, was actually formerly known as Intercom, and it owns 235 radio stations in 68 markets. Odyssey owns 15 radio stations right here in Seattle, including KIRO, the aforementioned radio stations. There are actually two KIROs, there's FM and AM, and it's also a TV, TV station, but, um, so there you go, uh, 235 radio stations in 68 markets. Now let's talk about TV. Seattle has a Fox affiliated station, like most cities, like all major cities, and the media giant Fox owns 29 TV stations in 17 markets and has, get this, 227 affiliate stations all across the country and it also maintains what is referred to as duopolis and that means it owns two stations in 11 of the top 15 major u.s markets media markets in the united states and of course fox broadcasting is a subsidiary of fox entertainment group which is itself a subsidiary of news corporation limited and that's part of the huge Murdoch family empire. Uh, KOMO in Seattle is owned by Sinclair Broadcasting Group, uh, which owns 200 TV stations covering over 40% of all the households in the United States. Sinclair has been a major promoter of conservative politics in the media, and according to OpenSecrets.org, there is a revolving door between government and lobbyists at Sinclair because two out of three lobbyists there have formerly held government jobs. Some of the Sinclair-owned TV stations are also Fox affiliates, so they work together in that regard. Until last year, KING, or King 5 as it's called here in Seattle, was owned by Tegna. When Tegna bought the station from the Bullet family heirs here in Seattle, there was a major outcry from local media members and members of the press because the company was known for downsizing news operations after it bought them up um, to improve profits. It was also known for crowdsourcing information and creating media that way instead of paying employees to generate the content. Well, Tegna owned 62 TV stations in 51 markets that comprised 36% of all U.S. TV homes, according to them. And in February 2022, hedge fund investor Kim Su acquired Tegna with the help of a couple other groups for $5.4 billion. And uh, also they assumed a $3.2 billion debt, these hedge fund investors.
So media is big business and major hedge funds and corporations often prioritize private profit, of course, over public service. Reporters Without Borders reports that over 100 newsrooms have been closed in the United States since 2020, most of them local news organizations. Seattle, like all other major U.S. cities, used to have multiple newspapers, but from and also from 1983 to 2009, the Seattle Times and the Seattle Post Intelligencer were under a joint operating agreement by the Seattle Times Company, and when the PI went online in The Seattle Times is now the only major newsprint newspaper in the city enjoying a complete monopoly of the newspaper industry locally. And many large cities are now one newspaper towns after years of downsizing mergers and newspaper closures. So many small independent community uh, newspapers have also disappeared in Seattle and other cities. I had a column in the Capitol Hill Times until a few years ago when suddenly and without warning, the Pacific Publishing Company, which owns several local community newspapers, decided to downsize the Capitol Hill Times by simply refusing to communicate with some of its employees. If you called uh, to talk to someone, no one would answer. Nobody at home. So what are some of the possible legislative and public policy remedies that I mentioned earlier? So this is the important point folks is what are we going to do about it? These are the kinds of things that I've been trying to lobby members of Congress and other folks on other public officials. Of course, if the Federal Communications Commission continues to cave into large media companies and allow media monopolies to grow in size and power, Unfortunately, there's little hope for the viability of independent and community media in the United States, except for maybe online platforms. What we need is more public funding of independent non-corporate media. And let me tell you folks, PBS and National Public Radio are just not adequate to provide the diversity of opinion and representation that's required in a healthy democratic society. We do have KBCS here locally in Seattle, which is a Pacifica Radio Network affiliate where I used to work as a reporter on Free Speech Radio News. But KBCS's signal is limited. It does cover most of the city of Seattle, but it's just not enough to create a widely diverse media landscape, which is, which is one other alternative station, especially when they mostly dedicate themselves So despite these limitations, I do have one idea that might at least help improve the lives of local journalists. Um, and that is that I propose the establishment of, quote, sanctuary cities, municipalities, and states where local governments pass resolutions in support of the rights of journalists to be free from targeting and harassment by law enforcement agencies. And these uh, resolutions would direct police departments to honor the rights of journalists. So. Journalists would be assured that they'll not be assaulted with crowd control munitions during protests, arrested, or have their media equipment damaged, confiscated, or searched by police during demonstrations. Uh, they should be able to cover uh, public demonstrations and feel safe and protected to do so. They should also be protected from prosecution for refusing to reveal their confidential sources. Confidentiality is one of the main tenets of any um, code of ethics for journalism. The United States currently has no federal shield law protecting journalists from that kind of prosecution, although Representative Jamie Raskin was able to pass such a bill through the House of Representatives, it did fail to pass in the U.S. Senate, unfortunately.
we need to try that again. Uh, I believe that our city of Seattle and the state of Washington and our legislature could pass laws to protect journalists in these ways if there was the political will to do so. It could also happen um, in other municipalities. They could vote to provide for more funding for independent media as long as, and this is the caveat, as long as, the caveat is because uh, as long as there's no strings attached because news organizations must be allowed to remain independent of their funders regardless of any political affiliations. Uh, tax credits and low or no interest loans could also help independent and startup media projects so that's something to think about. Uh, that's my advice to, to public officials is to work on these ideas. I'm available to work with you pro bono as a consultant on try how to draft these kinds of resolutions. Um, these are issues that I actually raised during a European Parliament conference on journalism in Brussels. Um, there must be an impenetrable firewall, firewall between the editorial departments of these news organizations and their funding sources. And that's to avoid any appearance of corruption or conflicts of interest. That's very, very important. Uh, media needs to be transparent, unlike Fox News, uh, so-called news. There are other legislative and public policy initiatives which could help improve the U.S. ranking on the World Press Freedom Index. For instance, whistleblowers like Julian Assange could have federal protection. But on a local level, communities must establish their own initiatives. But, as I always say, bottom line, if the United States wants to continue to be seen as a world leader in the protection and promotion of press freedom, it must first confront its own problems with press freedom and media monopolies. Because, as I said, we may not have a state-controlled media, but we certainly have corporations dominating the media landscape, as, this, as the statistics and figures proved earlier in my talk, and it limits the diversity of political views and ownership. This is Mark Taylor Canfield in Seattle for the MTC Report. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thank you to everybody who has. Uh, please click the like button down there and uh, share this video. It's very important that people become educated and media literate in this country. It's something that's sorely lacking. So thanks everybody for listening. And as I said, check out my music too. I'm also a musician, as you can tell by these instruments around me. Um, I have a song called Mother Freedom, which has a music video dedicated to people fighting for freedom and justice around the world. I'm also a weekly guest on the Jeff Santo Show on the RevolutionRadioNetwork.com and also a frequent contributor to the Tom Hartman Show. I write at DemocracyWatchNews.org. There's the Democracy Cast, which is our podcast, and I'm also all over social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. with Democracy Watch News.